Good morning and a very warm welcome to a day where industry leaders and innovators will share hugely relevant insights on the topic of NHS estates. The team here at National Health Executive have been busy behind the scenes preparing an event which promises to inspire education, innovation and collaboration within the community we're building. Whether you've been to one of our NHE 365 virtual events before, or if you're new to the platform, we've taken the time to listen, building much more than just a series of singular events. We've created allows you access to a wealth of resources, such as on-demand content, a digital marketplace, and plenty of networking opportunities, which can be accessed long after. This is all part of the community we're building to extend the reach of knowledge and connections shared today. During the event, we've still built time into the agenda to network with those in the audience who will be sharing the same interests as yourself. You can connect with other delegates using our speed networking functionality, which I encourage you to do. We're also able to share with you the digital marketplace, providing valuable expertise that you and your teams can digest when your schedules allow. Without support from our partners, events like these simply wouldn't be possible. It's worth noting that all the content from today is CPD certified. For every hour of content you watch live, you'll earn one CPD point. To receive your certificate, HE team at marketing at cognitive publishing.com. That's marketing at cognitive publishing.com, and they'll sort it out. So there's a bit of background to explain what's on offer. Now let's move to the focus of today. As we settle into a new normal and reflect on the last 18 months, it's crucial to consider the future of healthcare and how we might apply what we've learned so far. Specifically, the requirement to modernize our NHS estates and buildings, which have been ruled unsuitable for purpose since before the pandemic. The NHS can't be left with outdated healthcare facilities. The sector is driven to deliver the highest quality of care, and therefore the facilities must support this standard and the healthcare professional working tirelessly to deliver that care. The NHS must also consider the impact outdated buildings have not only on patients, but on the planet. Can refurbishments help reduce the NHS's carbon footprint? Our health sector is working on a variety of transformational projects for the NHS estate, ranging from new bills to and technological innovations. The sector is always looking for new ways to innovate and collaborate with colleagues locally, regionally and nationally to help the NHS adapt and deliver the NHS long-term plan. This is just a small taste of what we hope to cover today. An added benefit of today's proceedings is some friendly competition to reward you for your hard work. Score points by engaging with the platform's different elements and potentially earn yourself a choice of reward come the end of play. Our gamification tools will be active and feature an up-to-date leaderboard tracking delegates' progress. Those who finish in first, second and third places respectively will have 250, 150 and 100 pounds donated to either the Magic Breakfast charity or more trees in their name and organisation. The Magic Breakfast charity can give a child a nutritious breakfast and a chance to succeed at school with every 34 pence donated. So a £100 donation means that nearly 300 children get a good start to their day. Or if you donate to more trees, for every £1 donated, you guessed it, a tree is planted, helping our climate. And of course, you can only be in with a shout of winning by getting out there and engaging with all of the great content we have to share with you and connecting with your peers. Join a live session. There's 50 points earned. Make a connection with another delegate on the platform. That's 100 points. Ask a question in a session or engage with one of our exhibitors. Another 50 you get the gist. And finally, as we get ready to start our first session of the day, please share interesting things you hear across social media using the hashtag NHE365. That's hashtag NHE365. So let's kick off with our first keynote with Dr. Matt Sawyer, GP and Environmental Sustainability Consultant. Dr. Matt will be looking at decarbonizing NHS estates. Over to you, Matt. 
Uh, thank you very, very much. It's a, a great pleasure to be here and I am delighted to have this opportunity really to talk about something which is a, an absolute passion um, and it's about how can we get uh, primary care to uh, achieve great outcomes but with a net zero uh, footprint on the planet and estates is one of those really, really important parts. Uh, next slide please. Uh, so this is me. Uh, I've been a GP for, for 15 years, but I've also been off and done other things such as a, a master's in environmental science. Um, and I now work really towards how we can get primary care to be uh, net zero. Next slide, please. So really, we know that uh, the NHS estate and, and facilities account for about 15% of the, the total carbon emissions. Um, but actually, within primary care, this is closer to 20 or, or even 35%, depending on the on the practice. So if we've got if we know that our estate in primary care uh, and, in, uh, and for GPs is uh, is contributing so much, well, actually, where are the barriers? What's stopping us from doing better? And but also, where are the uh, the opportunities about what uh, what we can do next? Oh, go back a slide. Oh, thank you. Uh, so the, the, the barriers are, um, we, we need to think about that actually a lot of the, uh, the GP practices are uh, privately owned, so they're not actually part of the NHS estate. So how can we make funding available to help these decarbonise? For example, you'll hear later on today about uh, SALIX funding, if you don't already know, uh, and this is part of uh, funding which is only available to public sector properties. There's also non-GP parts of primary care. So we've got dentists and opticians and pharmacies. Um, and altogether, there are about 30,000 or so premises which all need to help to, uh, to decarbonise. So actually part of the NHS estate plan needs to help assist these. And we then need to think about the, that access to it, whether it's be public or, or private finance. Um, on this uh, on this diagram, uh, we can see that energy is a large proportion, but actually travel is uh, is a big part of the uh, the carbon emissions in primary care. So we need to be able to situate pract practices uh, and primary care um, facilities so that they are accessible to our patient population without the reliance on, on car travel. So this is whether it can link to, to active travel, cycle lanes, walking routes. There's a, a concept called 20 minute town so that the majority of the things that we need on a daily basis are available within 20 minutes of non-carbonized or non-fossil carbon travel, i.e. not in the car. Um, we, we know that, uh, that travel has a big impact on, on air quality, for example. We need to think about how low can we go? How low can our carbon emissions go from, uh, from primary care estates? And actually, I'll come uh, a little bit later to, uh, to an organisation called REBA, the Royal Institute of Building Architects, and how good uh, they think that we can, we can be um, collectively. But we actually need examples and demonstration models of good practice so that other people can learn from what's already happened. Behaviour change is, is really, really key, and this can account for up to 40% of uh, redu reducing our energy use. We know that there's some tech changes and there's refurbs and there's intelligent building management and smart meters and light sensors and all sorts of other things that can make up the rest. But actually, how can we improve the, uh, the staff engagement in the workplace? And then how can we incentivize best practice when it comes to energy and building management? We know that there's a law of diminishing returns where to try and save the last few kilowatts of energy takes a huge amount of additional effort. Um, and actually within primary care at the moment, and particularly in general practice, we've got our, uh, our work taken up with, uh, with other things such as the uh, seeing patients and uh, the vaccination program. And it's very difficult to then try and prioritize um, reducing our uh, energy use or, or inst instigating best practice. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the things that, uh, that we can think about is uh, some of the barriers to pro-environmental behaviour change. So the NHS workforce is huge, 1.3 million, and it is wonderful, as we have seen over the last 18 months or so. However, employees in all businesses, NHS included, do not behave the same in the workplace that they do at home, as they do at home. The motivations and barriers are really quite different. So when we're at home, we know that our energy use we have to pay for. So we don't tend to leave the computer or the TV or the lights or the oven on overnight. We're being very responsible because actually we know that uh, uh, it's our pocket that's going to suffer if we're not. But at work, there are different motivations. Uh, so next slide. 
brilliant, should show that there are some factors that are actually more important to, uh, to people in the workplace than they are at home. So it's not about money saving, for example, in the workplace, because it's not the, the employee's money. So actually, it can be about reducing use or preventing pollution or changing how things are done. And actually, this is far, far, far more important. So when we want to try and model best behaviour for our employees, we need to think about doing it in a different way uh, with different tools to if we were going to try and get people to change um, at home. We know that about half of surgeries are considered by staff to not be fit for purpose at the present. And certainly the vast majority, 75, 80 percent, uh, are considered not fit for the future. And this really prevents the staff from being able to deliver good patient care, but also working in a building which uh, has got a lot of inefficiencies, a lot of poor insulation or old heating systems, makes um, how, we, how we do our jobs uh, more difficult and really can affect um, staff morale. We know that seven, between 7 and 10% of, uh, of our practices in the UK are vulnerable to flooding due to climate change. Actually, how can we deliver a service at all if our building isn't fit or isn't built in a place that, uh, that, we, can, uh, that we can run? And I mentioned uh, a moment ago that the way that uh, buildings are owned uh, makes a big difference. So about half of GP practices are, are owned by the partners, about a third are leased from a, a commercial landlord or private landlord, uh, and about 15% or so are from NHS properties. And so because this ownership model differs, the way that we can, in, uh, we can uh, change behaviour or improve behaviour uh, is actually different in each case. So we need to be very, very uh, mindful about this. Next slide, please. I'm not going to go into detail on this. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but this is thinking about the uh, some of the barriers. And we can break barriers down into sort of social ones, economic ones, and environmental ones. Um, so, for example, if the, uh, if the practice owners or the primary care estate uh, owners don't have the time and knowledge or feel that there's a burden of environmentalism, we often hear the phrase, I don't have the time. We need to be able to find ways to overcome these. We know that patients have got uh, other priorities, so their health is obviously far more important than how their, uh, their practice or their building is performing. Um, we've uh, uh, increasingly seen over the last 18 months various <coughs> green initiatives <coughs> that <clears throat> that many in the sector feel that there isn't really a demonstration that there is national leadership or, or national importance for some of these things. So actually, it's about looking at how uh, premises are used, what the staff are doing within them, and breaking it down into several different areas and then subdividing those so that we can actually get to, to identify each individual barrier for, uh, for that specific premise. Next slide, please. So actually, what are the opportunities? What could we do today? What can I do as a GP or within the practice that can make a difference? Well, first of all, it's about measurement. So this, the, these numbers here are from uh, smart meters. This is uh, the average over a day's use from uh, a year or two back. Um, and we can actually see that even on Christmas Day and uh, uh, Boxing Day and the Sunday after Christmas, about the energy use. Now, actually, this practice, because it was a smart meter, we can get half hourly data so we can find out how much energy is being used at three o'clock in the morning on Christmas Day. Now, that might not sound particularly interesting, but actually, it's really, really important to then find out what is using that, uh, that energy, what is uh, taking it up so that actually we can start reducing it. So if radiators, if the heating system is left on, actually, we need to find ways to, uh, to manage that uh, smarter. So this practice, for example, was actually sometimes using 10 times more electricity at night than they were through the day. It means that we have to really think hard about uh, uh, what might be uh, uh, driving that. And secondly, it's about making every kilowatt count. How can we reduce the amount of demand um, uh, in terms of energy use from, uh, from our premises? Uh, next slide, please. So actually, it's also about then learning uh, from elsewhere. So there's a, a great uh, estate NH, uh, net zero carbon delivery plan, which is well, well, well worth a read. Next slide, please. Uh, there's the REBA, uh, Royal Institute of Building and Architects 2030 Climate Challenge. Um, these are suggesting that we could get from where we are in 2020 using about 200 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year, average energy use in buildings down to about 50. Imagine if the whole of the NHS estate and all of primary care could reduce their energy use by 75%. We've seen energy bills 
rise dramatically. Actually, if we can reduce that, um, that demand, reduce that energy use, it can be really, really important. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is uh, from BATS. This was done a few years ago. This is Operation TLC, which is turn off light, uh, turn off equipment, lights off and close doors. And actually, they saved themselves a lot of money, but also a lot of carbon. Um, but there were other benefits as well. And it's how do we get some of these uh, this good practice from secondary care and how can we instigate some of that into primary care? Um, next slide, please. For me, I think that uh, it's partly about how do we pay for the changes in general practice. Uh, and I always think that uh, the behaviour change needs to come before the, uh, the tech changes. Next slide, please. So really, we need to concentrate on what behaviours can, uh, can we amend? How can we reduce our energy use? And how can we make those savings, uh, put those savings into an investment pot for the practice to then use uh, on? Next slide, please. The tech that we can... Um, uh, put in place, so whether it be the um, the refurbishments, the insulation, the uh, uh, doors that actually fit rather than having gaps, the, the windows, etc. There are some companies that actually um, can install that tech bit of it and then get paid from the savings. And, and there's, of course, private finance that's available as well. Next slide, please. So this is taken from the, um, the four-step approach to decarbonise decarbonize the decarbonize the NHS estate. Uh, first and foremost, make every kilowatt count. We do this at home. We need to find ways to uh, incentivize and overcome some of the barriers in the workplace and really think about how, uh, how employees can, uh, can make this work. You can see on this list that there's some of them are uh, tech changes. So it's changing the way that uh, energy management systems work or how lighting works. Um, space heating is really one of the, uh, uh, one of the big areas that we need to, to think about. Um, second step is really about preparing buildings for the energy led heating. So how can we improve that building fabric as far as possible so that uh, we are firstly making every kilowatt hour count, so we're not using more than we need, uh, but secondly, so that as um, air source heat pumps and other uh, electric electricity led heating systems uh, come, that the buildings are, are fit for that. Um, thirdly, it's about switching to non-fossil fuel heating so that uh, we're really moving away from uh, anything that involves uh, fossilised carbon, re really reducing anything that we burn. Um, and the final step from my point of view or from the NHS uh, estate's point of view is increasing the on-site renewables, so uh, solar panels. But for me, it's very much to emphasise it's not about putting solar panels on first. I know that they're, they're, that they're sexy and they look good, but actually we need to start, uh, start with step one. Uh, next slide, please. And that's me done. That's 15 minutes of from primary care's point of view, uh, where we are um, and where we can get to. It's a big task, but actually, I think primary care has demonstrated over the last 18 months that we're up for a challenge. Uh, when we work together, we can really make a huge, huge difference. Um, and uh, I think that the two take home messages for me is uh, start with the stuff that we can change in terms of behaviour uh, and then uh, use any investment into improving the, the, the building fabric. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Matt. That was a great start to the day and leads us perfectly, actually, to our panel discussion on net zero estates. This discussion will look to highlight the opportunities for emission reductions in the NHS estates. There are significant opportunities in energy use in buildings, waste and water and new sources of heating and power generation, as well as looking at land use to reduce the carbon emissions of the NHS. The NHS estate and its accompanying facilities services account for, as Matt explained to us, 15% possibly more of total carbon emissions, including primary care, trust estates and private finance projects. So to align with 2050 net zero targets, the sector must ensure efforts are made that guarantee new hospitals and buildings are net zero compatible. We're here to discuss the changes NHS estates are making and its importance. Our Jane Taylor, Senior Estates Development Manager, NHS North East Essex Clinical Commissioning. Susie Vernon, Associate Director, Sustainability at Sussex Community NHS Foundation Trust. Vikas Ahuja, 
Energy Manager at Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust, Stuart McDougall, Director of Buildings for Stantec, and Dan Wright, Head of Sustainability at Kent Community Health NHS Foundation Trust. Now, don't forget to use the live Q&A feature to submit your questions to the panel. Uh, you'll find that on the right-hand side of your screen, and I'll do my best to ask as many of those questions as possible once we get going. So I think it's time to put my glasses on. It's got to that point where I need them, unfortunately, and uh, to say a very good morning to our first panellists. Uh, lovely to have you all here. Um, Stuart, I'm hoping that you might set us off, uh, if you don't mind, give us, um, an insight and a description into the work you've been doing with the Catapult Innovation Decarbonisation Programme. Yeah, certainly. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, for I guess for the last two years, um, we've been working with the Catapult Programme. Um, it's basically a catapult sponsored by by the government, um, by Bayes and the Cabinet Office. And effectively, about two years ago, it was um, given this task of sort of setting out about how um, we could practically um, deploy technology and create zero roadmaps to uh, zero carbon for existing uh, public sector campus scale estates. So we've been for the last sort of two years now looking at, in total, it was about 42 sites across the UK, ranging from a coal fired prison in, you know, deepest Wales through to city center hospitals. And effectively it's been really interesting going through sort of discovery stages of looking at the, the condition of those hospitals through to what technologies are practical and scalable and could be deployable over the next sort of 10, 15 years. And then also, uh, wedging into that what what renewable um, strategies can be there so effectively this this has been a, a really interesting um, exercise um, quite challenging because obviously existing um, public sector state is the more difficult end of the wedge compared to the new hospitals that are being uh, built now but um, there's been a huge amount of knowledge that's come out of that and uh, I'll probably just to sort of tail off with this is that um, Catapult have just published um, a report on that that has also um, gone into informing the sort of government's playbook on how to decarbonize um, public sector estates. So um, I'm sure more will come out in the conversation about some of the experiences there, but that's that's generally. So if people don't know about that, um, they should probably uh, look it up. I think it'd be great if, if we can, Stuart, once everybody's um, started off today, I'd like to go back to that and, and find out a bit about the learnings and, and what you found. I think that would be really interesting. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Let's um, introduce Susie to the conversation. Susie, a lot of a lot of the focus has been on the mitigation of climate change, you know, reducing our carbon footprint to net zero, as Dr. Matt so eloquently talked about this morning. But he also mentioned that our estates have been affected, haven't they, by climate change? I think he touched on flooding, there's heat waves, increase in heat related illnesses, and so on. So I guess that's only going to increase in the future. Do NHS estates need to start adapting to climate change as well as the big goal for net zero? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, a, there's as you said, there's a huge focus on reaching net zero, mitigation, etc. But actually, you know, we're, we're already seeing impact on our estate uh, within hospitals, um, both in terms of, you know, overheating, um, but also the sort of different types of um, issues that patients are coming forward with now that, you know, compared to five, ten years ago. And apologies for the, for the banging in the background. <laughs> um, what, is, it, so, is that your place? What's happening? Is there a bit of work, work going on in oh, progress? That's terrible timing. We're having the carpet fitted upstairs, so uh, many apologies for that. I was hoping I'd be able to mute the mic while that was going on, but no luck. So. <laughs> Don't um, worry, carry on. So, so yeah, so absolutely, adaptation is, is sort of one of those questions that we, we're trying to, to get to grips with and that we need to get to grips with, understanding really what the impact of climate change will be on our estate, um, on our patient communities, and what different types of pathogens will we be seeing in five years' time, in ten years' time, compared to, compared to now. And our supply chain as well, you know, we're already seeing issues around deliveries and that kind of thing. So climate change is going to impact us, uh, is already impacting us, and that will only continue despite all of our mitigation work. So we've got to understand what that means in practice and what we can do about it. I think that's interesting because it's something that isn't often talked about when we have these debates. We all sort of focus on the net zero and perhaps sometimes you know, forget the sort of climate change aspect. So it's interesting. Um, Ficas, welcome to you too. Um, what carbon reduction targets are, are the Trust working towards? So, uh, good morning, everyone. First of all, uh, um, it's so yeah. In in line with uh, UK's national targets uh, to achieve net zero by twenty fifty, uh, and and also in line with what NHS as a first healthcare system that has uh, that it has committed itself to, we are working towards uh, 
getting to net zero for our direct emissions by 2040 and then um, a step further, i.e. Uh, the emissions uh, beyond that, i.e. indirect emissions as well by uh, bringing those down to net zero by 2045. So th those are the quite ambitious targets that, that we are working towards uh, as of now. And how, how is that journey going, Vikas? Um, so uh, it's going to be a slightly long answer. Um, so apologies for that. But it, but we, we started on this uh, about 10, 11 years ago uh, when we, as a trust, first came to know about uh, Salix interest-free loans. Um, and that was when we first made an application to secure um, a loan for uh, so some some energy efficiency projects around lighting and and BMS, and since then we, we haven't looked back. Uh, uh, since then we have implemented around thirty six projects um, on on a on a on a variety of measures, whether it's uh, lighting upgrades, building management systems, boiler uh, enhancements, um, and 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 also. Um, bits around uh, improving, uh, sorry, replacements of uh, calorifiers with uh, with with uh, much more efficient heat exchangers. Um, so what, what what that has resulted in is that we've managed to reduce our carbon footprint by close to 20,000 tons uh, over that period. And that's uh, also uh, helping us in terms of making 2.8 million worth of savings on our uh, utilities as well um wow. so yeah like that sounds like you've made a, an incredible start well well done there and, and really it's inspiring i think for our audience um dan let's bring you into the conversation poor old jane i will get to you in a minute jane honestly i haven't forgotten that you're sitting there dan how does being a site tenant stroke site owner affect um the approach to a state a state sustainability do you think yeah so this, this is what i've been thinking about a lot so at uh, kent community health uh, we look after about 2 million people um, across Kent, uh, parts of Sussex and London as well. Um, however, we, if you compare the buildings that we own, directly manage, kind of have guide over compared to the buildings where we um, are occupants, it's a, it's a sliver, absolute sliver. So the issue that we've got is that as tenants, we don't have, in many cases, we don't have much say, uh, we don't have much benefit um, to... Uh, to invest capital investments, even if the landlord should agree to it. Um, so what, again, the result of these, some some conversations and more thinking, it's been uh, what we're eager to explore is if there's a way to join up um, the occupants of a building and landlords in a way that there's some kind of mutual, uh, mutual benefit. So uh, as Catherine Jandler wrote a few years ago now, it's not, uh, buildings don't use, use energy people do um, so you might have been uh, in situations like I have uh, and you walk into a lovely nice building uh, and then might have a pretty good uh, active and passive ventilation system and you might come across these this is where there are actuators on the windows and everything will open up at the same time um, better than uh, air conditioning however for the occupants in those buildings in many cases, you find that if it's not perfectly attuned, the noise can start to drive you a little bit mad <laughs> when that's <laughs> happening uh, many times a day. So it's that join up between tenants and landlords so that landlords can be making the benefits to the user experience, the occupant experience, with the added benefit of energy efficiency. Um, so that's something we've been exploring a lot as what are our responsibilities as tenants um, and how can we maybe look to change things for the benefit of the wider system um, and how can we support landlords and, and show them that we care so it's an ongoing process um, but I think it's a, a valuable discussion to have. Absolutely. I think I think you're right. When you're a tenant, it's very difficult to get things done. She says sitting in a leasehold flat with a balcony that's desperate to be done. 
it done because of the landlord. Um, Dane, we finally got to you. I'd love to hear about, you know, nothing brings this more to life than examples. And I'd love to hear about the community garden project at Clacton on Sea and how they how that came about. Tell us a bit about it. Thank you, Helen, and, and good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, the Clacton on Sea uh, garden community um, that really came about uh, after a long awaited scheme for a new GP practice to be built in an NHS property services owned building. Um, and listening to what Dan was just saying, this was about trying to work collaboratively um, with all of the organisations in the area, including the voluntary sector, um, and trying to create something um, which is on a piece of wasteland opposite that GP practice. Um, and with the help of NHS Property Services and a local residents association, as well as ourselves at the CCG, we donated enough money to um, create a really fabulous space, um, a social prescribing project. So it adds the social value element to net zero. Um, we have a seamless link to the social prescribing team. If um, someone um, is, has gone to their GP, is feeling very isolated, lonely, of which, of course, we uh, all recognised during the last year or so. Uh, we also in Clacton, unfortunately, have a very high rate of uh, male um, suicide. So uh, we looked at working with um, volunteers, members of the public, patients, and what would they want to see on that piece of wasteland? So um, what we now currently have, um, uh, phase one, which will phase uh, morph into more um, things in uh, the new year, we've got a lovely outdoor space. We've got a container unit, which is uh, our men's shed, um, but not just for men, um, where you can learn new skills, meet new people. We've got lovely outdoor space with a poly tunnel, um, with uh, outdoor planting opportunities, seating area and an outdoor gym. Um, and I went to um, the opening event and met some wonderful people uh, who had been, literally been sat at home for so long during the pandemic um, and had finally gone out and met some new people, met some new friends in a very short space of time. So it's made such a difference to people um, and there's lots and lots of opportunities moving forward um, for this space. Jane, it sounds wonderful, particularly as we come out of the pandemic and, and also with a lot of people suffering with their mental health. It sounds lovely that there's a place to come, a beautiful place to come and, and uh, meet new people and, and get involved. Um, Stuart, it's, a, it's always a long road back when there's five people on a panel, but back to you and the Catapult programme annual. So I wanted to ask you as well about um, how important a holistic master plan is when you know, you're know you looking at decarbonising estates. So if you can roll your learnings into your holistic master plan, that would be marvellous. Yeah, no, it's um, absolutely critical. I mean, a number of large campus estates, hospitals and other private uh, public sector estates is that, um, I mean, effectively, you know, we're, we're talking here about um, driving into a garage in your 1980s Ford Fiesta and saying that, you know, I'd like this to be a Tesla in a few years. And then, you know, the, the, you don't want the mechanic to turn around and say, well, the first thing I'm going to do is change the gearbox. You know, uh, it's really important that um, mm -hmm. a decarbonization strategy is knitted into every other aspect uh, uh, of a, the dynamics going on on NHS estates. Um, all um, large hospitals have got um, continuous churn, uh, revamping of buildings, um, uh, the dilemmas are continuously coming up. Well, what do we do with this this building? It's 1970s. Do we do we insulate it, um, or is it actually fit for purpose in terms of five or ten years time? So it's really critical that every decision that's made in a in a in a in a master plan to sort of meet clinical needs or meet any other expansion needs is actually um, considered with an overarching decarbonization strategy that looks at how they're going to meet the end goal in, in in 2032 or 2040. I mean some of the some of these things are quite major because in a lot of instances a decarbonization strategy is about decarbonizing heat and decarbonizing heat is generally about electrifying heat. Um, and electrifying heat using heat pumps. So traditionally where hospitals always have sort of said, well, we've got our big chimneys and our gas fire boilers. Um, we've got our chiller plant. 
there's opportunities there to sort of look holistically at, well, can you recover the heat that traditionally would have um, gone out into the atmosphere from chillers and recover that through heat pump or what they call as a, a fifth generation ambient loop heat network, where you basically can slug heat from one area to another. But all of that retrofitting into an existing hand, a hospital campus is, is, is certainly not without challenge. It needs to be thought about in a lot of detail you're talking about a heat network, which is a lot lower temperatures. So all of a sudden where you've had um, some plant that's been shoehorned into a, a plant room, that plant might have to double in size. And the, the implications of that need to be considered within the overall space planning. So it's, it's, it's quite, you know, it's challenging, but it's complicated, but it, it's doable um, within the context of a, of a master plan. So I, I'd urge anyone to sort of think um, about employing people to, um, implement that at a higher level and then knit down into the detail because i think it, it can it will make the difference between achieving this goal or you know possibly uh, encountering lots of work that could have been counterproductive along the along the road yeah no that that makes a, a lot of sense um yeah. susie i'd like to hear more if i could from you about your um, care without carbon strategy tell us tell us about that and the carpet man's being a bit quiet now that's good <laughs> for off. the moment for the moment <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so we developed um, Care Without Carbon back in uh, 2014, um, so a few years ago now, really as a sort of, as a way of talking about sustainability um, in a way that made sense to people o on the ground. So sustainability is one of those words, particularly in the NHS, where actually it sort of means so many things to so many different people and often obviously has a sort of financial um, uh, element to it. So, so Care Without Carbon was developed as a do what it says on the tin, how do we deliver high quality care um, in a way that is as low as possible impact on the environment. And actually back in, in 2014, we committed as a, as a trust Sussex community to uh, reaching carbon neutrality. Um, so, and, and that program is really about uh, developing something that is really truly integrated across the entire organization. And we know from the work that's come out um, over the last several years, how important it is in delivering net zero to engage people across the board. So I think it's something like 80% of our footprint uh, when you look at both direct and indirect um, impacts are actually uh, resulting from clinical decisions of one kind or other. So, you know, it's just not something that we can tackle in the estates department alone. It has to be something that we cover at a really integrated level. So, so that's what Care Without Carbon does. Um, it's sort of, it's a framework for delivering sustainability um, covering all the different aspects of the trust. So it's about working with clinical teams, it's about working with procurement, with HR, with quality improvement. Um, uh, it's working across the board to deliver net zero and really understand what that means uh, in practice to people on the ground. And the sort of the, ca the ca care without carbon as a term is meant to be kind of catchy and you know something that you remember. And, and actually, we've also kind of got a brand behind it, which sort of sometimes feels a bit cynical, but actually it's really about engaging people on this so how can we really get staff interested and excited about this as an agenda not only so that they can deliver change in their own sort of working lives but actually I think as we move forward and the challenge gets harder and harder we're now beginning to consider how you know how we as a, as a sort of as a trust and how our, our staff colleagues can uh, can actually use our influence as um you know within healthcare we, we've got a, a sort of different standing in community compared to others so how can we also be using our influence with others um the thinking about our patients but also working with others sort of working in partnership with others at sort of community um uh, level and other trusts other organizations so um so this, this care without carbon has developed a lot since it started back in 2014 but 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 at its core it's all about how we really deliver on this net zero agenda and bring people with, with us the key isn't it bringing people with you it goes, it goes back to what D dr matt was saying about behavioral change really and that's that's not just from staff it's from patients as well isn't it we're all in this together and all of our behaviors need to change that's being done um there's a question that Stuart I think might be interesting for you if you wouldn't mind Nick says how much importance do you see about the role of data collection um, and metering to understand building performance and usage at all stages in the journey to net zero it's been it's underpinned a lot of the studies we've done in the catapult program um, it was part of the one of the funding streams actually was to deploy uh, telemetry and metering because without without that data, you really can't make a, a value judgment in terms of where you are now and, and the improvements. 
So uh, I think even Matthew mentioned that in his introduction, that um, uh, data is is absolutely critical. So submetering, metering, energy management is is um, critical, and it's it's one of the the easy wins really. In yeah. in most um, sites we look at, um, if they've got a good energy management and metering um, principle in place, at least they know where they're going. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, it's surprising actually. Um, this in different organisations that I've been working with about how little people know sometimes about their power, which has frightened me. One no, or two absolutely. places I've been working at recently. Um, Mike, as, uh, tell us what you're doing at the minute and what things have you got in the pipeline. All right. Uh, so, as I said before, we 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 started back in 2011, uh, and obviously we've we've made a lot of progress since then but uh, during that period we realized uh, that it's actually taking us a lot of time and effort in getting these projects uh, one two maybe three at a maximum in an year uh, and and we had to go through that repeated cycle of applying for funding getting those projects done and in light of the fact that we are aiming to achieve those very ambitious targets of getting to net zero uh, by 2040, um, we, 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 we thought we, we need to speed up. Uh, and, and in that regard, we, we came to a decision that uh, going the route of energy performance contract uh, would actually help us achieve that. So, so in that sense, uh, what what would what we would be looking at is a portfolio of projects that can be done in one go, uh, and and we can also then look at some big ticket items, some transformational projects uh, that that we wouldn't be able to do uh, if we carried on with the approach that we had followed earlier. Uh, so, it took us a while. It took us almost 21, 18 to 21 months to actually agree, get the uh, framework uh, agreement sorted, get the uh, evalu uh, sorry, the, the get the tender out, uh, review the uh, responses and appoint a service provider. But I, I think in hindsight, um, everything uh, kind of fell in place at the right time uh, because just when we had got our responses back and had appointed a service provider, uh, the government came up with public sector decarbonization scheme um, and we made an application for that and we were very fortunate in securing 26.7 million uh, to implement uh, a, a, a variety of projects and one of them uh, Stuart already referred to is, is the heat pumps. Uh, so we are actually implementing a six megawatt heat pump system and 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 I, I think Stuart uh, it's fair to say you've already stolen my thunder uh, the, <laughs> we, 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 we are exactly uh, going through those challenges uh, and we are looking at uh, a step-by-step -step approach rather than trying to do everything in one big bang approach uh, uh, in on, on all sides. So so we've started on one side, uh, which is Charing Cross Hospital, uh, and we are looking at just one section, which is the tower block, uh, which is almost 50% of our heating load. Um, and and and, and as, 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 uh, uh, in, in terms of in terms of this is, this is what's in the pipeline. So we we will be doing it in a sequential way. So the next cycle or the next phase will look at other buildings and integrate and, and we'll be looking at integrating those with additional heat pumps that we'll be procuring in the next stage and hopefully fingers crossed uh, we can secure some funding from the next rounds of uh, public sector decarbonization scheme and thereby carrying carry on uh, with what what we are aiming to achieve uh, via those so uh, so it's it's not not just heat pump even though it is the biggest project in that portfolio uh, we have we are also carrying out uh, lighting upgrades, uh, insulation uh, measures, but what's what's kind of quite innovative uh, is is the fact that we have also gone for a one megawatt battery storage project as part of this uh, scheme as well. So, um, so yeah, I, I think we we uh, it's fair to say we we are really excited uh, about the fact that we we made this application. We are trying to get to this scale of uh, progress that we are aiming to make uh, or or a dent in our carbon emissions that we are aiming to make uh, and 
thankfully uh, we've been supported by that grant funding uh, otherwise I, I think it would have been really really difficult to get these kind of projects off the ground especially especially heat pumps uh, and and also battery storage which is which which we know uh, are going to deliver huge benefits uh, uh, battery storage for example in terms of improving the resilience of our electrical infrastructure and heat pumps in terms of uh, uh, aligning with the government's overall agenda of decarbonization uh, but uh, as we all know uh, funding is the key and and somehow we have secured that well it's very inspiring to have you on the panel today and i'm sure it'll be in inspiring for a lot of our audience members seeing what progress you've made progress is slow though as you said it's a bit like trying to move the queen mary isn't it when you're applying for funding and getting going but it sounds like you, you're doing some great things um dan do feel free to comment on anything else panelists have said and then i was going to talk to you about the role of the occupants what role do the occupants of buildings um play in reducing estate emissions but if you want to first of all respond to anything else that's been said it's a while since we heard from you um yeah fascinating points um completely agree with with uh Stuart and Rickus, um around yeah the importance of data uh, so one of the things we've been looking at is beyond uh, the flow of energy, the flow of electricity and gas use. We've been looking at monitoring temperature and humidity as well. Um, so looking at the outcomes of, of that energy consumption and humidity, particularly interesting in healthcare settings. Um, so yeah, very excited to, to learn more about how you uh, progress with those. And, and Vic as well done with <laughs> that successful uh, grant. Um, funding that's absolutely brilliant um as for how occupants um have a, a a part to play um in energy efficiency particularly looking at reducing carbon emissions associated with um uh, the estate so we spoke a little bit about the importance of having a joined up approach so both the landlord um and the occupant are doing things together so like jane you mentioned um at your site so it's a uh, a co-design approach. Um, one of the other benefits of having occupants at the centre is that it's occupants that can make real change. Uh, so one of the things we've been looking at on metering is we've been looking at uh, near real-time metering. So half hour is good. Um, in our case, we get our half hourly data kind of 24 hours later. It's too late. Um, instead, we're looking at uh, 12 second if less if not less metering so it means that the occupants can start to see uh, the tangible effect of their actions rather than this abstract concept that is energy use so rather than having um, a light that you can switch on switch off a computer you can switch on switch off mm -hmm. nothing happens if you're not dealing with the bill um, you don't have sight of the bill it doesn't matter instead we're looking at making it uh, real so we're looking at a feedback loop of Brilliant. how occupants can be involved. Brilliant. I'm aware of time slipping. Definitely, so yeah. I'm, I'm going to bring, <laughs> bring Jane back in if that's not rude. Do, just wonder if you can tell us, Jane, examples of carbon reduction initiatives that you've made at the community garden and, and whether the community garden can indeed perhaps help promote sustainable communities. Um, yes, definitely. I mean, the whole aim of the uh, community garden is for it to be self-sufficient. So the local people that are now using that space, they're growing their own food, uh, they're making friends, they're being active. We're going to have a wildlife garden in phase two uh, and a sensory garden. We've already got a compost toilet that's been created on site um, and uh, upcycling and recycling um, is key because that will also support people's health and well-being. So we've had lots of donations of um, pallets, broken pieces of equipment like bicycles, um, the, the people who are coming down uh, working together are upcycling and recycling. So there's some really good examples of, of what we're trying to do. Uh, and leading into sustainable communities, obviously also this is all about um, trying to get people to live healthy, sustainable lives. Uh, and it's a real key for the strong social connections and helping people to become uh, resilient, especially in the difficult times that we've all faced over the recent months. 
Um, and a real life example is that I um, met a, an elderly gentleman uh, a few weeks ago and uh, and after speaking to him uh, about a completely unrelated matter, it was very clear he was very lonely. He'd been suffering um, isolation. Um, contacted a social prescriber link worker down at the site uh, and asked them to make contact with him. Uh, I went down to an open day they were holding uh, and uh, I said, oh, uh, did the gentleman make contact with you? And they said, oh, why don't you pop down to the men's shed? So I went down there and there he was. Um, and he was so pleased to see me and he was telling everybody how he met me uh, and that I changed his life. And, oh. you know, it, it's really heartwarming, just a very small thing, speaking to somebody and introducing them to a, a, a really special place uh, just really helps with everybody's well-being right now. Gosh, it does. Um, Joan, I'm sorry, I've got a little tickle in my throat. <laughs> sorry, as we end the panel. Um, I feel like that, that half hour has flown by. I'd like to talk to all of you much more. So I'm hoping that you'll be invited back to perhaps one of our next um and NH, NHE 365s, because I feel in some ways we've just scratched the surface. It was really lovely to speak to you. Thank you so much. And uh, the clock's against us. I'm going to eat to the coffee break if I, if I carry on. So thank you very much to Jane, Susie, Vicas, Stuart and Dan. There is so much, as I was just saying, to cover on the topic of sustainable estates. So I'm very grateful to our panellists for getting through so many aspects in what seems like a small amount of time for such a meaty and important subject. Thank you for the question that came in too. Let's take a break now while I go and get that frog out of my throat. This is your first chance to engage with the speed networking functionality. And I'll see you back here at 10.40. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.